you're not putting that much primer on it's because you don't want to put a heavy on because and that's kind of what i wanted to get into is like some of these primers they have what what i call different top coats stand out to them so like for instance like you you spray them and you know you sand that first coat flat and you you sand that second coat and if you go look at it underneath an inspection light it still kind of has like a a waviness to it now there's a couple on the market that there's a few that don't uh like the 1107 it, it looks 1107 like, it looks yeah, like 1107. a finish um yeah and so what you're what you're basically trying to do um is that you're putting a ton on so you can sand it flat and then you're putting just a, a light sweetener coat that you you really scuff in it you're not you're not like grinding on it like we are no, no, on no. the first the first no. two coats yeah a lot of the a lot the last coat between is a lot of hand sanding just going back and just really refining yeah. it by hand. Yeah. uh just going back and just touching corners and things like that i mean that 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 third coat of primer is very thin i mean it's maybe you know a mil and a half or something like that at the most of primer that you're applying to it. Um, and, and then once it dries back, you look at it and then you have that really nice tight to the substrate look. Um, yeah. Other primers out there, 1107, 643, those ones tend to have a little bit, the, the coating I was talking on was a 170 primer before, but the 1107 and the 643 seem to have a little bit tighter look to the substrate. So it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, Sometimes, depending on what substrate you're putting it on in a refinish uh, form or if you're putting it on new, uh, the sanding can be a little bit less. It can be a little bit less, but it just it all depends on, you know, the job that you're running. But we run yeah. all those systems. We run all those systems and each one of them, it just takes a little bit of tweaking. There's not one sanding system that works exactly the same for all the coatings. All of them yeah. have a little tweaking, a little refining to them. Yeah, like for instance, like with me, the 1107. Um, if to me, the best application is a sweetener coat, um, yeah. or if you're running an oak job and you want to do now, you can do a full fill with all these ones. You can do it with 170, oh, oh, you do it every, every, but the, the top coat stand out on the 1107 is, is kind of unique. And also with the 643, the only thing I'll say with the 643 is like, even if you get it underneath an expansion light, it still has a little bit of that warble to it, but you can take it out with like a fine pad. And then refine yeah. it up with a very fine, very, very easily, or like a 400 Cubitron or whatever. Um, but uh, so on those three, like, where are you using each one of those, like, the most? So um, 643 is probably, let's say, talk about refinish. Let's talk about refinish where we're okay. having, to, you know, it was a stain grade and we're going to, uh, we're going to paint grade. The two primers that I'm pr predominantly using for the refinish is probably going to be the 643 and the 1107. Those ones, and the reason being is because that's the those are the ones that are going to give me the the stickability and the blocking of the of the coating of the stains and things like that that I don't want to deal with. 11, 1107 probably being uh, the kitchen that I'm going to is the worst case scenario. It has all of the ugly things that I don't want to deal with, and I'd probably use 1107 first. That one seems to be at the top tier of the primers uh, when it comes to the 2K primers. Um, 643 stands up there really well. Also, um, I like the 643 because of the quick recode time and because of the quick sandability and the dry time of the coating. Yeah. So that one is another one. Uh, a 170 primer, I do use it on, two, on refinishing applications, but I typically save that one for lighter substrates. If it was a natural oak or if it was a natural maple, I tend to use that one for that. The darker colors, I'll use the 643 or the 1107. Yeah. So it's, I know it's kind of all, all over the board, but it's, to me, it's like each one has its shine. Yeah. If I'm dealing with new substrate, if I'm dealing with new substrate, then I like the 170. The yeah. 170 primer on new substrate, it just seems like it kind of fits all the boxes 100%. Yeah. Um, Price point is right for the primer, durability of the primer, adhesion of the primer, and the thickness of the primer is there for that. So I know I'm kind of all over the board when it comes to these, but for me, I'm just looking for what comes off of my eye when I'm refinishing and what I want to see. So, yeah. but, and the sanding systems are very similar, but there are some tweakings in some of the primers. Um, 11, 1107 that primer doesn't take quite as much sanding as say the 170 does. Right. Uh, it seems like 
a little bit easier sanding because it is tighter the substrate. Same with the 643. 643 has a real nice build. It doesn't seem like it's quite as much sanding. But if I'm doing a new substrate, and especially uh, depending on the wood, like say if I'm dealing with poplar or something like that, and I need a heavy build to get rid of all the grain of the wood, mm -hmm. then I like the 170 primer. That 170 yeah. primer has the build the, the build that I need that that the other primers quite don't have. Yeah. So I'm going to use that 170 primer, especially if they make a – and I don't know why they do this, but they'll make a, a maple frame – uh, MDF center panel, and then give me the boxes in Poplar. <laughs> <laughs> Why the F they do that, man? But yeah. trying to make those look the same, it seems like that 170 primer kind of fits the boxes for those. Yep. So, you know, it's, I, I know I know, guys, it's a little bit all over the board, but the more time that you have finishing, the more time that you have and learning experience, you're going to see kind of some of the things that we're talking about and 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 be able to check those boxes on your list and how to do them yeah. uh, most of them all the same we'll start with 320 from 320 we'll go down to 400 and then 400 we'll do all of our refining with a very fine or a super fine pad super fine pad is typically only used between top coats i really don't use it for anything else than between top coats yep um if we're talking about surf prep sandpaper my my most go-to is probably the the 10 mil i seem to like the 10 mil the most it has enough firmness to it that it cuts but then it doesn't break through when you're sanding through the edges it doesn't go through the edges so much so those are the those are the sanding systems that i typically use cubitron is definitely uh you know on the top of the list and then surf prep is stands right there with it for all your refinement and all that so they seems like they work hand in hand together yeah no you're exactly the same as me so i would say um in terms of primers if you need the highest build 170 is your ticket if you need something that's sort of in between, I think 643 is there. If you don't need that high build, then I think the 1107 there. Now, interestingly enough, I've used all these on MDF too, and I still think 170 would be the best, 643, and then the 1107. The 1107 works really well on MDF, but it gets really, really hard, and you end up using more sandpaper because that that primer gets so hard to sand everything flat, if that makes sense, yeah. um, than it does with the other two. So I've kind of learned that, you know, I, I really don't like the 1107 for new. I, I don't, I don't use it at all for new because it just, it, it gets so friggin' hard. And even though it sands well, it's just easier with the other two. Yeah. The, the, you can't move the real estate quite as much as you can with the other two primers. Yeah. For me, where the 1107 shines is in the refinishing application. Yep. Absolutely, it, just, it, it, it checks all the boxes in that in that in that form. Uh, the 170 and the 643, even though they all powder up real nice, they seem like they cut a little bit easier yep. than the 1107 does. So I like the I like to keep the 1107 primer for my hard refinished products, my hard my hard refinished jobs where they're nasty, gnarly, and I don't want to deal with them. All three of those primers, you can do 100% full grain fill. Yep. All of them. I mean, make them look like maple. Yep. Every single one of them. No, 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 no ifs, ands, or buts. And I know guys have a hard time believing it, but um, I've gotten the system down where I can do it in a in a three coat system, two coats yep. of primer and one top coat, yep. and you can make it look like maple. Yep. Um, maybe on the outside edge of the door, or maybe the inside detail of the door, you might need an extra little spot prime. But for sure. the most part, all the flats will look like maple 100 yep. percent, you know, yeah. so the, and that, and all comes down to like we were talking about a little bit earlier. It comes down to your substrate sanding. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's the problem. That's the problem with uh, with a lot of guys is that they're not sanding their substrates flat. They're sanding their substrate smooth, but they're not sanding them flat. Yeah. Um, that's another thing I like to talk on is if we're refinishing oak or if we're refinishing any of the harder woods. Um, I'm not sure what your go-to is, but uh, my go-to is either 120 or 150 Cubitron sandpaper for the cutting ability of the sandpaper. And it's hard for people to understand that you can actually sand oak flat, even though it's got green. Even yeah. though it's got the wobble in it, it's hard for people to understand that you can sand that substrate dead flat. And for me, that's where you need to start. If you don't start there, you're never going to get the, you're never getting none of the process flat. No. Right. You'll never get any of it flat. And 
I don't know where you're at on your sandpaper, but I think even sometimes you might even go a little bit more aggressive than I do. Yeah, I'll, I'll go down to 80 sometimes. Um, I have found, though, that – and I need to I need to kind of test them side by side, but I think you can actually get there quicker if you do 120 because sometimes with 80 is you actually grind it. Because what you're doing essentially, like, if you have, you know, a uh, – a, a divot or the grain in it there's there's finish in there and so essentially what you're doing is you're you're sanding that back flat the rest of the wood back flat with all those divots that are in it because if you just you know scuff it well you're just piling more and it's harder for you to get into those divots that's that's why a lot of guys are using the the rollers and stuff is they're trying to push it in that grain because they're not sanding the surface flat to begin with so when i put my primer on <clears throat> my surface is flat it goes into the grain yeah it's it's like looking at my fingers maybe this will show the explanation looking at my fingers just like this and you can see all the ridges you know right. that that you're ridging over here 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 and then what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate all those ridges to get them down to the low spot yeah and, and and that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get this here you're trying to get this to all be at the same level even if there's grain in there don't worry don't be so concerned about the grain just worry about the levelness of the of the of the substrate to get that completely flat. Right. So at the end of the day, when you finish sanding, that it's flat, just like where my fingers, so that it's all the way across the same level. Yes. Once you get it there, now you apply your primer. It's it's all going to be the, on the same level, and and then from there you sand it, and then you apply your second coat, and then now you're it's dealing. It's all with gone. Flat. Yeah. Now it's all yep. gone. Yeah. yeah. So those. Those are the little things I think that the the beginners or the guys that are struggling with that I see their their the pictures they send me and they still have a lot of wobble. They still yeah. have a lot of wobble in the primer. They still have a lot of wobble in their in their coating. And what they're doing is they they're going too fine. Uh, there was a guy who just posted a video. He was having the coating delaminated. And come to find out later, and I talked to him, he was sanding everything with 220. And he says, I've sanded 220 that way all the whole time. I've never had no issues. Well. If you're dealing with oak or if you're dealing with maple and you're sanding with 220, basically what you're doing is you're polishing the surface. That is not a, that is doesn't have enough tooth on it to to give you the 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 bite that you need to the coating. Even if it is a water-based coating, it doesn't have enough for me. It doesn't have enough tooth to be able to get this coating to stick to this. And so that's why I'll typically go with a little bit more aggressive. Now, if you're dealing with a softer substrate, like say alder or a uh, pine or maybe poplar with their little bit softer substrates you might be able to get away with the 220 and it still has enough open pores that once the coating penetrates it actually bites to it and doesn't come loose so be careful in what how you guys are sanding and what sandpapers i know that most guys want to sand it smooth as they possibly can um but the problem is is when you're dealing with refinishing you're dealing with there's still finish in there no matter what even if you re yeah. even if you strip it even if you strip it and sand it, there's still coating that's inside mm -hmm. there. So yep. that, that that's that's one of the big issues you guys got to remember. That's why you need a little bit more tooth because you want to have the two best of best of both worlds. You want to have a mechanical, which is the teeth of the coating biting into it. And then you want to have your chemical bond, which is going to be your 2K coating that's going to bond to that substrate. With those two in combination, you'll never have an issue with adhesion. Yeah. You'll never have an issue with adhesion. I, I've done many, many samples, and I know you've done hundreds more than I have, and having uh, adhesion issues is never one of the issues that I have. Yeah, and I, I've got a video on it. Was uh, we? I think I did one on deglossers, and then like I took a piece of UV material, and I sanded it all the way, like 320, 220, 180, 150, 120 180 well the further you get down the food chain the better bond you got because you got more for it to grab grab to the sweet spot is somewhere like 150 to 180 um yeah. especially if you're doing a solvent finish you need more tooth than with the water base we, we talked about that in another video um but yeah 220 on i've never done a refinish on oak where i went above 120 it's always been even even if I do new, I never, I, I don't, I usually don't go above 150. And I think we're pretty close. Because you don't, you don't, you don't see the scratches. The yeah. You don't see the scratches. Not with, well, the other thing too is with the build of the primers no. too. No, <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, I've proved that. I've done the, 
the uh, I had that cherry job I did where I, I kind of explored that that avenue where it was it was so many dents and dings in this thing and I was like this is gonna be insane we'll be here all day filling this stuff so I just said we're just gonna eighty grade it all out sand it all flat and I stopped there I did, I didn't go beyond eighty two coats to one seventy one top coat boom as a matter of fact on that job it was funny the guy that hired me to do it was another uh cabinet guy here in town and he doesn't really like doing refinishing but but he does it because he has clients to ask for it and he said he goes hey man you think you could calm down a little bit i think you're giving these people the wrong impression we're trying to sell them cabinets not make their old stuff look like it's brand new (laughs) oh right (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, man, sorry, we're gonna, I got we're gonna get, get ourselves out of the market here. Yeah, of, uh, yeah, he's like, he's like, he goes, he goes, just dial it down a couple of notches. <laughs> well, I mean, well, and, 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 but see, he was, this is the thing is that, you know, back in the day when I was running solvent, I mean, you had to get it finer because you, the coatings were so thin that it would show everything through. Right, right. It showed, it showed every imperfection. So you had sure. to go a little bit tighter. But now with the build of the of the of the water based primers and the high solids of these water based primers, it's really eliminated that, you know. And and I and the more and more I've done testing, I mean, you go just a little bit more aggressive than I do. I like 150, but I'm using Cubitron 150 for my heavy cutting, which it has a it has a way it has a way more wicked tooth to it than a traditional sandpaper does. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. So if I was using another sandpaper, if I was using a uh, a Merca or a Kling or a Kling Spore or which I don't really use those sandpapers. They're to me they're not they don't really they don't last long enough. Uh, but say if I was going to go to a surf prep sandpaper, I would probably go to a 120 grit. And to me, the 120 of that and the 150 are very comparable in how they cut and yeah. and how they'll prepare a, a substrate. So if the guys that aren't able to get Cubitron, if you're not able to get Cubitron, then then the surf prep sandpaper, especially in the film, is really nice. But yeah. go to a 120 grit for all your standing for your refinishing. I know you're gonna feel like it's it's too aggressive, um, but if you're seeing it, it's because you're not applying enough primer. If you're seeing your scratches, it's because you're not applying enough primer. You're not putting the primer on heavy enough. And there is a sweet spot in there too. It all has to do by look, but uh, with a 120 scratch or even a 150 scratch, you should be able to prime it, and it should look like finish coat when you're done. Yep. with any one of the substrates so once you get it to there then from there you know you're 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 in the promised land and then your top coats are going to come out looking amazing all right so let's talk a little bit um about spray equipment now we know you're a, an airless guy but that's kind of changed like some of the tips and stuff that we have available that we didn't have last time we were talking about discussion and you, you talked on a little bit but what's the go-to tips for you in your in your applications on on airless and then i'll talk about air assisted airless uh with that as well okay so well can i i'll talk on both i'll talk on the airless and then i'll talk okay. on the pp the pps system that i use okay yeah yeah perfect so so for airless um pretty much most of my primers were running with a 310 or a 210 actually um the one thing that guys need to realize is once they start spraying some of these primers because the primers are very because they're high solids it seems like it widens out the fan a little bit wider than it does when you're using the top coats. So for the most part, I've gone to a 210 or a 208 for spraying primers, just depending on where I'm at. We talked about the sweet, the 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 kind of the sweet spot of primer, the the butter primer is the the final coat of primer. So typically on most new substrate or refinish, I'll run a two, on two a three o excuse me a 210 tip for my first couple coats. We'll sand them all flat and everything. And then if I need to use a little butter uh, primer on top of it, then I'll go to an 08. So it keeps the substrate really nice and tight. Um, most of my top coats were able to spray with a 208. And and especially in clears or any of the whites or lighter colors, we run a 208. Um, I've noticed that in the dark pigments, and we talked about it in another video, the, the 06 tip has really changed the game for me for the super dark colors. The Tricom blacks, the... Uh, what are the other there's a couple other real big popular black colors. magic black magic uh you know you name it you know whatever dark colors that you want that have heavy pigment loads it seems like an 06 tip uh is is the way to go uh they they really tighten up the coating they allow you to spray multiple passes and not having to deal with any sagging or running or any of that those those for me have been really my go-to uh now i 
I spray a PPS system also. Originally, when I first started spraying the PPS, I was using a 1.5 uh, tip in there quite a bit. And um, I've, I've even changed and refined that. So uh, I've moved from a 1.5. A 1.5, I'll run my primers on if we're running primer. Uh, it gives me the pretty much the same sprayability as I would say as if I was spraying an 08 tip or an 09, which would be between a 10 and an 8. It seems like I get the same build. Um, but if I'm running top coats, it seems like an 03 uh, seems to be the sweet spot for running uh, any of your white pigments or your clears. 03 is absolutely amazing for those. Whites, light colors, Swiss coffee, uh, Navajo white, any of the light colors or any of the clears, 1.3 works amazing. If I'm running dark colors, I'll go down to a 1.0 tip. And pretty much the fluid pressure and the air pressure is pretty pretty all of them is pretty similar typically i'm running around 20 to 25 psi on the gun and then i typically have between three and eight psi on the bag uh with 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 pressure on the bag and those seems to be like the sweet spot and it just may need a little bit of tweaking just depending on temperature of the coating uh you know time of day things like that it makes a difference in how the coating sprays but those seem to be like the sweet spot so uh, 05 for primer 03 for clear coats or for um for lighter pigmented colors uh and the gun that i'm using as you know is a, a cat x uh it's a total finishing solutions gun it comes from total finishing solutions it's actually um uh it's actually um what's the manufacturer that they have CA private Tech. Label? CA it's a ca technology, CA technology yeah. that they have private labeled really nice gun yeah sprays very efficiently and um and then for the dark colors i'm going down to a one o tip and the one o just seems like it just atomizes those dark colors super nice allows me to get multiple passes which you need on the dark colors so that i have the flow uh that i need to get the build so that the coating's level real nice and gives you that really nice tight substrate look so i've been playing around with them a lot i use both of those systems a lot the airless and the pps I'm actually thinking about maybe investing into an air assist, uh, but if the air assist would be predominantly just for the shop, I won't, I'm not going to truck a compressor out to the job site. And I've dealt with that issue here in California. A lot of the houses that we deal with are old electricity and even just running a little five gallon compressor gives us enough challenges trying to get it from not tripping the breakers and things like that. So, you know, I'll, I'll use the air assist predominantly probably just for the shop and out in the field, we'll stick with the airless because we've been having really good success with that. Yep. So, yeah. and air Absolutely. assist, I know, air assist, I know that you, you, uh, you really love the air assist. Uh, you go back and forth between that and the airless also, but I know you like yeah, the air assist. Yeah, uh, right now I've been running a lot of air assist and the main, the only, the only reason why I am is because I'm just playing a lot with it. Um, I've had so many guys that are like, hey, we want you to do an air assist video, but I'm not going to do one until I really have it dialed in and I believe I've got it, you know, where it needs to be. Mostly with my air assist, I've been running um, Envirolac, Renner, and CIC. Um, with those different coatings, it's all over the map. Um, primarily for primers, if I'm doing a two coat system with Envirolac, I'll run a 13 thousandths. That would be an 09 for Kremlin users. And then I'll either run an 06, which would be a 411 for everyone else in the world with the Envirolac. Uh, I've tried 09s. I can run an 09 with my Cobra, which is kind of interesting because it has higher fluid pressures. But the 09 does not work as well uh, when you go to a traditional piston pump style. Um, now with the CIC stuff, I like 1107. I'll run an 11 thousandths or an 09 with their primer. Uh, the top coats, um, either an 09 or a uh, 07 tip. And then for their clears, you can run an 07 or an 09. So I don't know, man. The air assist thing is like, it's a lot more uh, painstaking to, di to dial in a coating. A lot of it has to do with viscosities and all that sort of stuff. Um, I will say... So if you are running, so here, here's the trade-off with it is the smaller the tip, the higher the fluid pressure. So 
if you have like a Cobra or you have like a 30 to one pump, then you can use those smaller tips. Okay. It, it is interesting. It will lay the coating out more glass like in a thinner coating than it will if you're using bigger tips. The trade off is that you've got to have the higher fluid pressure, a lot of air pressure, um, and you got to deal with the clogging aspect of it. So if you're going to run that, you've got to run like a triple filtration system. So you have to have, you know, filtration at the hopper. Then my opinion is I switched over to the uh, super filters, which in both of those units run the exact same filter as a tri -tech. So, you know, the one, the, the 50 mesh or the hundred mesh sure. filters, it's, ex I mean, it's the exact same spring, exact same everything. Um, and then from that, you have your filter in the gun. Now I have tried the way we were doing it was we had the small gun filters. We had a double filtration system there, but what happens is, is like it cuts down on your flow. And then it also like, you go through a crap ton of those filters because um, they're so small, you can't really clean them out. Now, you can put them in a sonic cleaner and maybe use them four or five times. With going to that super filter, I run my the filters in my gun um, probably, you know, four or five times a month, you know, a month instead of one use and throwing them away. You almost don't even get anything in them. So yeah. the whole air assist thing, I don't know, with water base, it's like a whole nother world. Like the easiest thing for you guys, you know, if you're wanting to get in the game and get just, just get a, an airless and, and be done with it. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I will say this though, like I have learned too, like I, I do run a, a heater system on my stuff in the winter time. I haven't even really used it in the summer. If I spray vertical, I'll use it in the summertime because we have really high humidity here. Um, but it's it's just the whole air assist thing is is it's all over the map. Depends on who you talk to. Um, sometimes you know you get a little bit more of a ripply looking finish off of an air assist um, than you do with an airless because you're not dumping as much material on. And I just don't know how much that that really matters. And there's some coatings like the 688 is one of them. Um, you can use an 07. You can use the smallest tip. You can crank the fluid pressure as much as you want to. It doesn't change the way it looks coming off the gun. So, you know, you can get a air assist gun um, and a small compressor and you can hook like a 47, a GM 47 or a, a, a Kremlin Excite gun up to your tri -tech. And that's pretty sweet. That's a pretty sweet yeah. rig. And that would be better for guys that are doing on site uh, because with the water base, you just need so much friggin' air and pressure to atomize these coatings that you almost need like a gasoline um, or you've got to take, you know, two, two of these smaller um, compressor so you can get about 13 cfms um if you're shooting a small kitchen it's fine the face frames but you get into these large refrigerator re refrigerator panels of some of these big kitchens and even these wait. small ones you have to wait you know you're like halfway through it and you're like come on come on come on come on come on come on yeah <laughs> you gotta start going again so yeah. you know i it, it just it is what it is now if you're shooting solvent then I mean, heck, you can take a little Husky compressor out there, and and it runs it all day long. Well, you know? well that's that's the thing, and that's the one thing that I that I've learned too is like you can conserve your air in those things by being on and off the trigger quite a bit, and 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 that's where it comes to you know experience and spraying. I notice when I'm spraying with my small compressor when I'm doing uh, thinner coats of like isolator or things like that, I can get away and spray a lot longer by just being on and off my trigger. And, and you'd be surprised at how much air you yep. can conserve yep. by being on and off the trigger. So that's another thing that guys that maybe don't have the big compressor on site, if you pay attention in how you spray, uh, say you spray your side to side first, you know, because I like to cross hatch even the big panels. I don't go all one direction. You're on and off sideways going this way. That little bit that you're on and off the trigger allows just that half a second allows that compressor to, to recycle the yep, air yep. and keep your air pressure up. And then as you have a wet coat on, then you would spray your longs, which you're just doing a mist coat on your ups and downs. You're doing a very light coat up and down is going to conserve your air. So I would spray my sides first, 
you give the compressor a minute to charge to be full if you don't have a real big compressor and then spray your ups and downs that'll be another thing that will definitely help you i i was talking with a guy here in california who's been running his kremlin he's been running a 2k coating water based and he was having a lot of issues with orange peel he just couldn't get rid of it and i think a lot of it had to do with this tip the size tip that he was running you know, yep. he, I think he was running, I think he was running 11 hundredths or something like that size tip. Oh, that's huge. To be, that's like a 15. Seem, that seemed, seemed pretty big, you know, yeah. and I think that was the, the issues. Now on the flats, he didn't have any problems, but when spraying the verticals, it's, it's a, it's a yeah. huge tip. Yeah. So, so when you go vertical, whatever size you would spray flat, you almost need to go up a yeah. size. Yeah. And, and, and that's the problem with air assist. Like with airless, you kind of have. A 10, an 8, and a 6. When you get into air assisted airless and you're spraying as many coatings as I, you have to have like 13, 11, 12, 10, 9, 8, 7. I mean, I mean, really, I guess you could really get away with um, 13th out, 11th, and an 09 if you're good, but you almost want to have that 07. So you're talking four different tips. And the other thing that you run into too. Like when you get into the Cobras and stuff, because you have those higher pressures is, is like if you use a 411, you can get like a, an 8 to 12 inch fan pattern because you've got yeah. so much fluid pressure on it. So like, for instance, like Russell, he uses like 207, um, 307, like he uses a smaller fan width with the Cobras. Whereas it's interesting if I go to my Wildcat, I actually get the actual fan distance that you're supposed to. So I don't know, man. It, it's it's a it's a it's always hard for me when someone starts talking air assist. I, I have to say you have to be specific with me what coating you're going to be using because that's what tips I'm going to recommend based on what coating that you're using. Um, the thinner yeah. the coating, the smaller the tip. Yeah, there's not it, it, there's not going to be one for all. Not like if you were running an airless, you could get away running an eight for everything. You could run an yep. eight with your darks. You could run an eight yep. with your primer. You could run an eight for everything. And then your air assist, I know you're not going to have that. The other thing is, is that you're having to deal with is, you know, depending on what pump you have running air assist. I mean, I don't have a lot of knowledge, but I have common knowledge in, in air assist. And it depends on what size pump you have, too. You can have a 30 yep. to 1 or you can have a 15 to 1 or a 14 to 1 or a uh -huh. 12 to 1. So all these different things are going to make huge factors in how the coating yes. is going to come out of the system. Absolutely. So on a bigger st size pump that's a 30 to 1, you might only need three to five PSI of air to actually atomize the coating as opposed to a smaller pump that doesn't have the pumping power to pump the material. You might need more air pressure to get it to atomize properly. Yep. So it's like all these yeah. things that you have to play with to, to, to figure it out. That's, that's about the sum of my knowledge. When it comes yeah, to no, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, and, and that's the struggle with air assist. And I think that's one of the big, um, like I know I've talked with Daniel from um, ICA, Daniel Petrosky, and he like those little 14 to one pumps from Kremlin. I mean, you're, you're going to have to reduce the material in order to shoot it. Like it just ain't going to happen. Like my my personal opinion shot all the water base I've shot. Um, I would not buy smaller than an 18 to one, but I will say that. Kremlin has changed the design and, and this is a factor too is the size of the fluid section in the pump makes a difference too. There's so many freaking factors with these air assisted airless units that it's very difficult. So Kremlin has a 15 to one now that has the same fluid section as a 30 to one. That makes so a why difference. would yeah so why would you buy one or the other? Well you got less air consumption with a 30 to one than you do a 15 to one because of the ratio. So like, you know what I'm saying? Like you're, you're only having to turn your, your, so at a, a 30 to one at 20 fluid pounds, you're already at 500, right? Sure. A, a, sure. a 15 to one, um, you know, at 20, you're at, you know, what, 200 and something. So you, you have to factor all these things in. So really though, the higher the ratio, the better. So, I mean, my, my, um, my Cobra at 20, you're already at 800 fluid pounds <laughs> Yeah, because it's, well, it's a 40 to yeah. one. And, and, that, and that's what I, and, and, and that's kind of where my knowledge comes in from using cup guns for all the years that I use cup guns. I think it's kind of some of the same tech, same thinking and, and what tip size you're using and how the coating comes out and how much air you're going to need to atomize the coating. 
yep. because yep. you know you can you. You can use I can use a 1.8 or I can use a 1.3 and I can achieve the same finish just depending on how much air I push behind it yep. to get it to atomize. So mm-hmm. and it's playing with those things now. And this is what I tell people is like if you're if you if you're coming into it and if you're learning um, to to use an air assist, you you're gonna have to spend some time and some homework and a lot of testing to yeah. get that system yeah. dialed in. Absolutely. I've seen more and more guys suffering and 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 having a lot of issues. Because of that, I think that's the, the reason why with uh, with uh, some of the turbine systems, so many people had so many issues because yeah. there's a complex of things that need to be done. Your yeah. your pot pressure, what pot pressure are you using that's put, pushing the fluid pressure through and what air pressure is being put behind it to atomize the coating. I mean, that's not something for a novice. That's that, that those those guns and those systems take a little bit of of experience and know how. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it, what size fluid tip are you using to get the coating to come out? Now you can use a big fat fluid tip. The problem with a lot of the turbines, they don't have the air pressure to atomize the coating, yeah. So it ends up coming out looking like cottage cheese. Yeah. So it's a lot of playing around. It's a lot of playing around, as opposed to you know the simple system is the airless system where you know you can just take it, pull it out of the box, drop your lines in the bucket, or put you're the fluid in your, and you're good yeah. to go. So yeah. you know it is. It just depends on the technician and the technical side of it and who wants to who wants to master that side of it. Um, yeah. You sprayed both systems. Um, do you see a better finish with one or the other? No, I mean, if you if you know what you're doing, I, I think the only advantage that I see with air assist is like than I do with an airless is that you as you as we're talking about it you can always see you have fluid pressure air pressure so if you have something that has really really tight reveals you can dial your fluid pressure back half of what you would and then put your air pressure higher so that it's acting more like an hvlp or a conventional gun and you're putting a thinner coat on it which which you how you would control that with an airless would be a smaller tip Sure. You know, but yeah. you've got to know what these coatings are supposed to look like off the gun. And most people, when they get into water base, they don't know. So yeah. that's that they're, they're, you know, they're basing it on what they saw in solvent. And it's, you know, I always explain it. Most coatings, if you have that sort of dimply golf ball look, then it's going to take a couple seconds and it'll it'll level out. And, and the thing is, is all these coatings are different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like some of them are worse than others. Some of them are less than others. Some of them look like glass off the, you know, the finish. I mean, it's it's all over the map with these coatings because of the resins and, you know, how what kind of flow additives do they have and blah, 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 blah. So it, it makes it a lot oh, more yeah. complicated. Yeah, and the temperatures and the, and the, and the weather temperature outside and the humidity yeah. in the air and all those things are all factors. So, yeah, you know, for the new guys that are starting out, I think – the main things that they want to focus on, if we can do a little bit of a recap, uh, the main things that they need to focus on is their is their initial sanding. Uh, that that's going to be the number one thing that they can focus on. That's going to make their finishes look the best. Is getting their substrates flat and getting their substrates prepared so that they're ready for primer. Um, don't ever trust the door manufacturer to send you brand new doors and think that they're ready to prime right out of the box, <laughs> because 99.9 percent they're not. Uh, sometimes they polish them with a super high polish to make them feel smooth. Mm-hmm. So they might even they might even put uh, a half inch pad in the manufacturer. They might have put a half inch pad that's a that's a super fine and to make the door feel polished and smooth. And it could cause you problems with adhesion later on down the road. So yep. even if you get new substrate doors, do your own sanding. Take yep. the time, go through and do your do your scratch on them, do your process on them, and it's going to allow you guys to achieve better finishes. Same thing with primers. Same thing with primers and everything else. If you can, if you can get me, you know, if you can get them to the same thing, getting them flat sanded, getting them uh, to the to the to the level where they need to be, so that they're prepared right, your top coats are going to look even that much better. So these are things that, it, and and inspe- an inspection light, you know, um, I was not really a true believer of the of the surf prep inspection light and, until the more and more classes that we did together. And the more the more experience and more time I had using them, and now it's it's an instrumental part of my business. 
uh, using the inspection lights from Surf Prep. Uh, I don't know of another inspection light out there that is as good or high quality as theirs. Um, the nice thing with theirs is that they're really bulletproof. Uh, the fronts on them are glass finished so that they can be wiped down if you get overspray on them. Uh, they're explosion proof. That's another thing that's added. I know a lot of guys are talking about going and buying, uh, uh, you know, lights for 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 automobile, cars. yeah, for cars and things like that, and 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 putting a transducer on or transformer or whatever to allow them to allow them to be able to to hook it up to power. But the problem is if you're spraying any any of these coatings, especially solvent coatings, you take the chance of you know blowing yourself up. So having the right gear. They've made it uh, a next level. We don't use the inspection light every day while we're sanding, but we use it for checking the doors before they go to finish. So, you know, depending on the light, depending on how the light is in the in the in the area that we're working, if we have low light conditions, then we use the we use that light. It seems to really help a lot, uh, but we'll definitely use it for our inspection before it goes to top coat. And it it it, it definitely changes the level of your coating and your finish. So a couple little things that might help people. Uh, everybody says, you know, the amount of money that you're going to spend on these products are, you know, astronomical. Uh, when I first thought about buying a three by four sander, I thought it was out of the world. Six hundred dollars for a sander. Same thing with a, a dust extracting vacuum. Uh, when I first spent the amount of money, I spent six, seven hundred dollars on a vacuum. You know, I had people telling me I was crazy uh, until you use them, until yeah. you use them. And the thing is, is that. Uh, the amount of money that we charge for the finishes that we do, and not only the amount of money we charge, but over time and how many jobs that we do, they pay for themselves because your quality of finishing gets that much better. Yep. So, you know, those couple little things, uh, you know, substrate sanding, checking your checking your uh, primer before top coat with a good inspection light. Uh, those little things are going to help you guys finishes go to another level. So absolutely. You know. I mean, I'm a fan of the inspection light. I get it. You know, they're $600, but, you know, I, I, if, if I was to sit here and I, and I asked the finisher, if I could make, you could make your finishes, I'd say 35% better. Would you spend $600 to do it? I think if people are, are looking for that quality, they'd say, yeah. So I'd say that'd be my first thing is get an inspection light, you know, and look, if you can't, if you can't afford the, the, the circuit prep, right, get something, at least something. Get something. Something that, that, good, that you though. can see, something, yeah. Something good, something that puts off a lot of, uh, you know, illuminates that that you can see well. Um, I originally was using uh, some Dewalt lights or some other kind of lights, and I thought they were fine. I thought they were okay, but they don't. <laughs> yeah. cast, they don't. They don't cast the light the right way. That's right, right, right. That's the deal. They, they that's the deal. The is the, that's the deal. Is the where the way it casts the light? Because um, <laughs> you know properly. Yeah. It's that it's that rake lighting coming over the surface. And um, ideally, um, I only have one light. But if you really want to get crazy with it, having actually two lights that are this way, then you'd have no shadows and you can see the whole door. I was talking to Austin about that one day and he was like, yeah, man, he goes a lot of shops. They just use two lights so they don't have to spin the doors. I was like, I need to do that. But, you know, there's always something you can spend money on. So I know it's always. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other thing. And in, in my shop, we do a lot of long doors. So I have the 24 inch lights and I want to invest and get the three foot lights for the long doors, too. Yeah. So that'll be my next investment is buying a couple of those. Um, for us, it's real simple. I don't have one standard sanding section. So the nice thing about those surf prep lights is they have a couple eyelets on the back that you can screw them down anywhere. So yeah. we have the, you know, you've been in my shop. We have a lot yeah. of our carts, mobile carts. Uh -huh. So, you know, we take them and we can move them whichever direction we need to wherever we're working at. It yeah. really does make a big difference. But, you know, uh, unless you have 2020 perfect vision, and even if you do, I, I would swear you do the test. Sand the door as best as you possibly can in whatever natural light you have. Sand it as best you can, and then take one of those inspection lights and put it up to it, and you will see how much stuff you missed. Yeah, it'll it'll blow well, your mind. And I had I had a setup for a long time, and I thought it was great. Was I had um, I had three LED lights that were set up in a rake lighting situation, and I, and I think I have a video on this where I show you the door, oh, yeah. and I'm like I sand it, I'm like. And I'll be honest with you, you know, the pictures and stuff I show and the reason why my doors are look so good is because we can see it on it. As a matter of fact, my employee calls it Satan's headlight. He goes, this is the place that yeah. things go to die. 
As a matter yeah. of fact, I'll tell you a funny story about this real quick, and then we got to jump off because we've been on here forever. But um, I did a job. It was the first time, and I was like, hey, man, go through these doors and check to make sure that they're ready to go and just wrap them up. Well, he turned on that friggin' light, and I came back, and there was like three doors packed up. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, well, man, there's a spot. I was like, turn the light off and look at it. <laughs> he goes, oh. <laughs> turn the light away. Turn the light away. No, yeah, definitely the light will definitely pull your pants down. I mean, if you can if, if you can get your doors looking really nice and primer with that inspection light, and I mean, if you can get them looking good, they don't have to look perfect, but if you get them looking good in the inspection light, your finish oh, yeah. is going to look next level. amazing. Yeah. yeah. It'll look amazing. So anyways, those, those are the couple tips. You know, guys, a real quick recap. Um, water-based primers next level. Uh, you know, we've talked on, you know, the move from solvent to water-based. Uh, I won't go back to solvent. I'll tell you that right now. I had a contractor actually recently call me asking me if I would split a job with him. Uh, he wanted me to run solvent PU. And no, I, I, I won't go back to doing that again. I just, I don't want to, I don't want to put myself in that situation. Uh, you know, being on site, having to spray inside a tight, you know, spaces with you running those kind of coatings i'm over it and and i told him i said why don't we just do it all in water-based he doesn't have enough familiarity with water-based to think that it's going to be as good of a finish yeah. or is going to look as nice of a finish so but you know if, if you know as the future goes forward i can only see the benefits of water-based and how they're going to move to another level because we're just scratching the surface guys you know oh, you yeah. think just in the last 10 years all, all, most of these innovations have been made in the last 10 to 12 years. So we're just barely scratching the surface on where water-based coatings are gonna go. Uh, you know, solvent is pretty much, at, it's at its end. It's already it's already run its whole cycle. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I don't plan on going backwards. I plan on going forwards, you know, so that's- Yeah, the only, the only unique thing with solvent has been the blockchain stuff that uh, Malaysi has, but it's just, it's one of those things Things that's not really ready, readily available and the price point on it prevents people. But the thing with water base is, it's like it really, like I said, it's in its infancy still and it's already like so good, um, yeah, yeah. you know. And so like, yeah, I mean, it's just amazing where this stuff could could potentially go. And then, you know, what's interesting is, is like this next year, you're going to see a return to single component products. I've seen you some. Are- I've that seen some, yeah. are as good as some 2Ks on the market already. Um, and so that's going to be interesting, that. And then also a lot of companies are getting away from polyazirine crosslinkers, um, and they're going to some newer crosslinkers that's more, you know, uh, health conscious and safety. Either. They've Either even got some them. stuff that's like 30-day pot life crosslinkers. Um, so, I mean, there's some really interesting stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on right now with high-gloss water base. Um, which may end up, uh, you know, replacing some of the fine paints of Europe stuff um, for some people. And if they want a faster, you know, I mean, obviously fine paints has its, you know, mystique or whatever, but I'm seeing some stuff that might be interesting and it might end up replacing some of that and uh, better profit margins um, and, you know, better costs for the clients as well. Oh, definitely. I mean, the 1K, the 1K, uh, let's call it the 1K revolution. I mean, the thing is, is that you have a lot of end users that don't want to use any of the additives that we're using. You know, you, you have a lot of them sure. that want, they want the capabilities. Um, the 1K uh, coatings that are coming out, we have, there's quite a few. I know Renner's got a new a new coating coming out. I know that uh, we know that Envirolac has a new one coming out, the T9000. That's an amazing primer, really nice primer. I don't know if any of them are going to have, they're not going to have the capabilities of a 2K primer, but for what they are, they're next level primers, definitely. Yeah. Um, the only the only issue that I've seen with any of the 1K primers is just the the to get the water resistant de- a little bit better. That's it. Yep. But when it comes to when it comes to blocking, when it comes to any of those other things, they have it. They have everything that you need. They have the adhesion. They have the stain blocking, they have the dye blocking, the dirt grease blocking. They have that there. It's just the one more little tweak to get the, the water resistant up. Um, but it's the same if you were using a vinyl sealer. The vinyl sealer right. doesn't have the the vinyl sealer doesn't have the water resistance that uh, a 2K primer does either. 
It's not so, even close. <laughs> not even close. So these are these are things that you know you're going to have to give, and there's going to be finishers that are willing to give that compromise to only use a 1K product, and that's yep. fine because the 1K the 1K top coat underneath that underneath that that primer is going to still give you at the end of the day a better coating than a catalyzed than a pre-catalyzed lacquer. Yep. All it's going to be a better product all day long. So, you know, um, but they're getting there. You know, they're getting there. I've, I've already tested the T9000. I know you have. I know a couple handful of people, other have. And the only thing that I've seen so far in my, my views is that the water resistance, even after a long dry time, is, is comparable to a vinyl sealer, which to me, it has the blocking abilities. It doesn't have the odor. It doesn't have the, 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 the noxiousness of the, of the smell, the coating. For some of those people who want to run a little bit cleaner system, they got what they need now. Yeah. It's gonna eliminate. It's gonna eliminate those coatings like Ben, which is a horrible water resistant coating. It's gonna. It's gonna eliminate. It's gonna eliminate coatings like Ben and a, and a handful of the other ones because yeah. it's gonna give you the adhesion that you need. It's gonna give you the blockability that you need. I mean, this could actually change the the market a hundred percent. You know, Absolutely. And, 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 I, and I know you've talked with Stefan about this and I've talked with Stefan about it. You know, I'd hold on to his hat because the sales of that coating could go through the roof, you know, not only on the regular market, but on, you know, the DIY market also. Yep. Because of because of its properties, they've really changed that. They really they went after it and they really achieved something there. And, and I'm really looking forward to see the end results of it. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, a lot of the other coating companies, I think they're going to have to, you know, step up and. And, and formulate something similar to it or, you know, try to formulate something a little bit better. And Absolutely. if they do, if they do, they're definitely going to have something there to sell. That's for sure. Yep. Because just in the, just in the little bit of talking that I've talked on the, on that 1K coding, I have a lot of interest from a lot of people. A lot of <laughs> yeah. interest. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a like, of, it's pretty surprising actually. It's super surprising to me when I started talking about a 1K primer that had, that checked all the boxes, uh, and how many people were so like, please, I don't want to use 2K. I'm using 2K. I don't want to use it. We, you know, we're using only the 2K in the primer, and we're using 1K uh, on, on on the on the finished coats, and we're not using any 2K on the job. They're still using you know primers like Ben and things like that because they don't want to. But well, of course, they don't realize the volatile you know VOC of a Ben is pretty much the same as vinyl cedar. It's you know over right. 550. You right. know, it's, they don't re- they don't even know that. But, uh, you know, because they figure if they sell it at Home Depot or they sell it at a chain store that it's safe to use, you know. So, you know, but, there's, you know, you know, we're, we're, you know, these are things that, uh, you know, up and coming next couple of years, I'm really excited to see where it goes. Absolutely. All right, Dennis. Well, man, I appreciate it. Always a good time talking to you, man. And uh, Always, bro. we will catch you next time. We'll see you next time, brother.